This is a football. This guy already wants to catch it over here. Who said that famously? This is a football. Vince Lombardi, thank you. I knew you were going to get it. Tell me your name. John. There's prizes for John. Thank you. In 1963, Vince Lombardi went to camp with the Green Bay Packers. About this time of year, it was actually July. And he held up the ball and said that very thing. This is a football. Now, he was talking to people, kind of like I'm talking to experienced, very well-educated people in the realm of football. He was talking to guys who had been playing football 12, 15 years, essentially all their lives. And yet his first words at training camp to those professionals was, this is a football. He went on to say, with every fiber of my being, I will do everything possible to make sure you play your very best every down this year. Now, there are a couple of other notable things about the background of that short speech. By the way, there was an offensive guard in the back as soon as he said, this is a football. He said, slow down, coach. <laughs> of course, the whole room laughed. Didn't deter Vince Lombardi, if he knew what kind of coach he was. But they were coming off of a championship game. They had made the championship game and lost, which makes me think it's even more interesting that he was about the fundamentals, even though they were a championship team in their own right. After he made that speech, the Green Bay Packers never lost another playoff game. He went on to win five NFL championships, a couple of Super Bowls. But the point is, as professional and well-qualified and well-prepared as they had become for their profession, it was still about the fundamentals. And so that's what your profession is about. That's what every profession is about. That's what mine was about when I was in financial services uh, for so many years. Scott, thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, and welcome, everybody. Our pleasure. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, I don't know why I'm leaning so right here. Good to see you over there. Uh, shout out to my Aggie right here. Undergrad or law school? Okay. All right, you got there as soon as you could. Yes. All right. So I'm an Aggie. Let's get that out on the table right away. But what's so intriguing about your uh, profession? If I had to do, do over again, maybe I'd have gone back done what you're doing, because I love words. You know, that's what your life is all about, isn't it? That's what law is all about. It's about words. Uh, it's interesting, Winston Churchill, who wrote 10 million words in his lifetime, which is unbelievable. Uh, there's a cover of my book up here, a recent book. It has 64,000 words in it, and it nearly killed me. He wrote 10 million words in his lifetime, and he said that words are the only things that last forever. So profound. In fact, his primary opponent, Winston Churchill's primary opponent, said that Winston mobilized the English, English language to win World War II. That's powerful. The scripture says that words contain in them the power of life and death. I, mean, I don't know how much more serious uh, it can get. And I, I came across another uh, verse the other day that was, uh, I thought was appropriate. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And I'm thinking courtroom setting when I hear that. But really, in everyday life, it's, life is about, all about words. I mean, that's what relationships are about. If you're not talking to someone, you have no relationship with them, or at least you have a strained relationship with them, right, if you're not talking much. So words are important, and so words, which are also my tools for you today, are one of the, what we call at the old school, one of the 12 keys to professional success is to have words that wow, that's what we call it, and that involves doing away with some words that don't work, pause words, crutch words. Who knows a pause or a crutch word they'd like to throw out there that they've heard their teenage daughter say, Scott? Uh, uh like. Hear it all the time. 
By the way, I'm proud of uh, our oldest daughter. My wife's here supporting me today, Nisi. She's a St. Mary's alum, by the way, uh, attorney. Any other St. Mary's alums here? Oh, there we go. Okay, so you got two. All right. But we were talking, uh, our oldest daughter was doing an internship at PepsiCo in Dallas, and she's, a, she's an Aggie. We're all Aggies. And um, she wanted to do her end of internship speech for us so that we could help critique her and give her a couple pointers. She gave us, what, 22 and a half minutes? Not a single like in the entire speech. And, I, and we talked and I said, I don't care what else she said. The fact that she was able to have that clean of a speech in this generation, she blew it away. And sure enough, we got a report from herself. You know, she's pretty critical of herself. She said, yeah, I felt good about it. And I feel like I, I blew it away. This guy right here, one of your favorites, right? Socratic method, Socrates. He was as ugly as the day is long, they say in the history books. Face only his mother could love. He walked like a crab around Athens and hardly had any clothes on. Never got paid for a speech. Never wrote a single word. Plato came along later and wrote down the words of his mentor, Socrates. But it's interesting, he's known for the method that your profession is founded on, asking questions and using words. And one of the famous things that he's known for, uh, to me as a layman, is that he said life is about definitions. Right? Life is about definitions. Oftentimes we disagree in our society or in our family or community because we're defining words or terms or phrases differently, right? And so Socrates was the father of don't do that because if we can arrive at the same definition, we're on our way to coming to some kind of resolution or agreement or progress or innovation. So that's why my friend Socrates is up here, uh, a truth warrior. And as I mentioned, we've developed at the old school 12 keys to professional success. I call them the 12 old school keys to professional success. So what I do at Gracious Invitations like this when I come to uh, Baylor Law School, I also work with uh, the Baylor University uh, side. I do a lot at A&M, SMU, UTD, so a lot of regional stuff. I have, we went to China for a couple of weeks, was, which was quite an experience. Anybody else been to China uh, in here? Love to tell you about that sometime. They're just like we are, by the way. They're young college kids. The similarities are very interesting. In fact, we'll do a, an exercise here in a moment that I did in China, and it was amazing how similar the reaction was. Um, but what I do is I go around and, and teach these skills where anybody will listen to me or let me. And what I hope to do today is give you three or four of those, knowing what you're trying to do. You're either coming out of law school waiting on some, gra on, uh, some scores, right? The boards, uh, or the bar, I should say. Uh, or you've been in practice for a little bit, or maybe you've been in practice, or you've been in the profession out working for a while, and you're looking to make some uh, career directional moves. Tried to pick three or four things that I believe will help you in that regard. Obviously, we don't have time to go through all 12. Uh, that's what my book is about, but uh, we'll try to give you some that, that will <clears throat> get you down the road a little bit and maybe give you some more confidence. And it'll spur even better ideas than I have. That's what's great about it, is I'll tell you something, you'll take it and run with it like I never would have. So, uh, so that'll be good. Well, three things I believe if you could do these. If you could build rapport, so three stages of a relationship. If you could build rapport, manage your time, and because I... Um, and wed to a wonderful lady and attorney, I could insert that heaven joke right here if I wanted to, but since you all know it, I won't, you know, where they go and their billing is way longer than their life, right? Okay. But my wife's going to heaven no matter what. Y'all aren't laughing. Y'all know that joke, right? Okay. All right. I hope I'm not getting on any bad, any bad side telling a joke early. Okay. Hey, I'm an Aggie. Remember that. They tell jokes about me all the time. Anyway, if you could build rapport, if you could manage time, and if you could build relationships, all right, so I want you to think about that. If you could build rapport instantly, 
You could manage your time, what we call time leadership, not just time management. And you could build relationships long term. Those are three key ingredients to any successful career. And I can only assume that is the same case in the legal profession. So what I want to do to make sure we're awake, because you've been doing this for half a day already, and now you have some, probably some carbs inside of you. So I want to do an exercise here. Um, well, Scott, perhaps you will assist me in a conversation. We've, we've done this before, so. All right. Turn my mic on right quick. Okay. Okay. So Scott and I have just met. What, we're, what I'm about to demonstrate to you is called a LAVA conversation. LAVA is an acronym. And the idea is to, when you first meet someone, is to warm up the conversation and get it flowing. Because so many times when you first meet someone, what is the first question they ask you or you ask them? What is it? What do you do? Now, I want you to think about that question for just a moment. Remember, life is about words. Are there any issues with that question? What do you do? What are some problems that might arise right off the bat while you're trying to build rapport with somebody? Uh, they don't have a job. Okay. They're in between jobs. They've been laid off. You know, they just graduated from school, and they don't have anything to tell you. You know, life happens to all of us. We all have challenges, and some challenges revolve around our occupation, and so that's good. If you ask that question, you may get them to feeling a little down on themselves because of what's going on in their life. Okay, what's another issue with that question, what do you do? Does everybody do the same thing and make the same amount of money in this country? All right. Can you see that there might be a socioeconomic gap that is created immediately with that question? Okay. You folks are highly educated, accomplished professionals. You've had opportunities. You've taken advantage of them. You've worked hard, whatever the case may be. Not everybody gets that opportunity. Or, or not, most people don't have the abilities and the mental capacity that you do uh, to achieve what you have achieved. And people feel certain ways. They feel bad when they haven't achieved maybe what. So you don't want to start right off the bat in an arena of intimidation because of either your profession being perceived as so much greater than theirs or vice versa. If you're on the other side of that conversation, you wouldn't want somebody to put you in that position. Now, I'll show you in a minute with this law of a conversation how we overcome that and we're still going to find that information out. We're just going to do it in a way that we've built rapport before that happens. Okay? So don't ask somebody, what do you do as soon as you meet them? Instead, we'll do this. Hey, how you doing? I'm Jim Whitten. I don't think we've met. Scott Fraley, how are you? Scott. Scott Fraley. Correct. Okay. Good. Where are you from, Scott? Well, I grew up in West Texas, but I live in Waco now. Oh, no kidding. So where in West Texas? Sweetwater. Uh, they have a big trailer factory there. Holiday. Oh, they do. Holiday yes. Rambler. Yes. I'm from Amarillo. Yeah. So you're on the southern end of the old Dust Bowl. I was right in the heart of it. Did your family live there for quite a while? Or? Yes. Abilene, okay. Sweetwater, that area. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to stop the conversation. What just happened? How did we connect? By having a, a commonality. Okay. In this case, a geographic commonality, but I could go on. So, what, did, so you went to Sweetwater High? I did. Are they the Bulldogs? Because they're all Bulldogs in Texas. No, the what Mustangs. A, oh, the Mustangs. Okay. Well, I was the Sandys. You know, the sandstorm with the the Sandys. With the yeah, right. yeah, with the. Uh, all right. Stop the conversation. I've connected again geographically. West Texas. We're talking about high school. What's Scott thinking right now? Is he thinking? I wonder what Jim does for a living. No. What's he thinking about right now? Is he even thinking about me? He's gone back. Nostalgia creates rapport. I've got him thinking about his hometown, his high school. Scott, what kind of activities were you involved there in Sweetwater? Did you play any sports or uh, extracurricular yeah, activities? Yeah, I, I played basically all three major sports, football, 
a basketball track. Okay, what were y'all, what, 1A or 2A or? Uh, at the time we were 3A. Oh, okay. So the whole town came to the game every Friday night? Every Friday night. It yeah. was a big deal. Yeah, what, which one was your favorite? Which uh, one? Sport. Oh, football. Oh, okay. Always. Football's king. Yeah, well, I was a basketball player in Texas, so, you know. Right. We were always uh, second class. Okay, what's going on there? You see how he's going back to the high school days? You know, I could have, I could have, you know, I could have been state. I could have thrown it over that mountain. Remember that movie, right? So he's he's got very usually this is going to evoke some emotions and some thoughts that is pleasant, and you're setting a stage. And and all I did was do what? I asked him questions. That's all I did. You know this. I'll state it. Those that ask the most questions control the conversation. He who talks the least, I'm talking the most today because it's a lecture format, but he who talks the least says the most and really directs the conversation. Okay. And so what I'm doing is I'm building rapport for Scott. If this were a social situation, I would have made the first move to say, hi, I'm Jim Whitten. I don't think we've met. So right from the outset, because if I don't do that, what's Scott liable to do? He won't do it now. But he might ask me what question. What hey, Jim, do? what do you do? And then here we go. Now, there's a creative way to answer that question. Maybe we can talk about that if we have time. Uh, but if he gets me into that mode, then I'm going to have to come back and say, well, what do you do? And we have that situation where the rapport building uh, opportunity is not as great. Okay? So that we could, we could go on and on. I'd talk about basketball. He'd talk about football. He'd talk about who else he knew in West Texas. But for the sake of time, we won't go on, but you could see how we could go 20 minutes just on that. Easily. Right. Who you know out there and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So let's move to the, so the L in lava is locations. So that could be where you're from, why are you here. What, you know, I could have asked him what brought you to Waco, and that would have been another story, and I would have told him my experience in Waco, the time we came here and y'all tore down the goalpost when you beat us and all that, you know. Went for it, instead of going overtime, you went for it for two and you won it, and it was it's a terrible memory, so we probably wouldn't have gone there. Anyway, um, the A in lava is for associations, okay? Associations. So we're continuing to have the conversation, back to the conversation, and I might say, because we're at a conference here, I, I would say, hey, Scott, who do you know, who do you know here? Did, do you know somebody? Is that why you're here? Yeah, I know a handful of people. Oh, okay. Uh, give me an example. Who, who do you know here? Uh, Bob Jones over there. Oh, I know Bob Jones. Really? How does y'all meet? You know, we were uh, old friends. Okay. That, he's from West Texas, or? No, I, I met him when I moved to Waco. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I, I met him probably 20 years ago. Wow. Yeah, uh, his family and I go way back. Now, that's all false, but the point is, okay, you see what happened? The association. Now, why wouldn't I jump right into family necessarily? Yeah. Do we, do we ever have any problems with our family? No. <laughs> right, we can't choose our family. We can choose our friends, but not our family. Sometimes, unfortunately, family's uh, not a great thing to, you know, tell me about your spouse or your kids or whatever. Uh, now, if he had offered. If he just said, oh, yeah, you know, we've lived there all my life, uh, you know, I met my wife out there, and we had three kids and raised them out there. All right, now he's told me all about that without me asking. But by me just finding an association other than that, you see, it's safe, and I'll let him go there if he wants to. Or if he wants to ask me about my family, you know, do you have family? I, you know, I could say, do you have family in this area? And he could say, yeah, I've got kids and two grandkids and so on and so forth. And then... If I had green kids, which I don't, we want some, but we don't have any yet. Um, we, we need to get them married first, optimally, but anyway. Uh, they're old enough, but then we could start talking about that. And by the way, <laughs> we're not having that conversation here. There is nothing more connecting. Do you have green kids, by the way? Not yet. I'm mean, okay. in the same situation you okay. are. Okay, <laughs> all right. Got to get them married first. But when, I t when people talk about their grandkids, I try to get into that, if, if they're of that age, and I kind of, I try to work around to get to that topic, because that is through the moon in terms of, right? Uh, it's just, I, I, that's why I want grandkids. You know, we stay with some friends in College Station this week that had grandkids, and they were there with them, and it's just, you know, it's great. 
Uh, but that's a good one. If you can work around and talk about grandkids, man, you are on your way in terms of rapport. All right, in this example, we don't have that, but just keep that in mind. So A is associations. V in lava is vocations. Notice I'm putting a plural on these. Why am I putting a plural, for example, on associations? Because I don't want to just know about the convention. I might want to work it around a family or partners, you know, law partners. Maybe I ask about that because I know one of them or something. Same with vocations. Has everybody in here, um, anyone in here not always been in the law profession? Okay, one, two, oh, wow, okay. So almost half over here. So almost half did something else before they went in uh, to the law profession. Now, Scott, I, I see you're a professor here, is that correct? That's right. Right. Have, have you been in academia your entire career? No, I was a litigator for over 30 years. Okay. Now, I was able to ask him about that because I had that prior knowledge. Coming to this convention, I knew Scott was a professor, so just assume that for, for a second. By asking him if he's always been a professor, what have I done? Now, again, nostalgia goes back to, did you say you were a prosecutor? Or, no, uh, trial lawyer. Oh, I'm sorry, trial lawyer. Okay. Uh, now he goes back to that, and now I can ask all kinds of questions. You know, I might say, well, you know what, my, my wife is uh, a trial lawyer. And boom, then we're talking about it. I'm not a trial lawyer, but, you know, I've heard enough stories to kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, anybody have, um, you think you have a, an interesting previous life? Raise your hand and just tell us. What, what did some of you do that raised your hand that are now in the legal profession? What did you used to do? Anybody? Oh, yeah? Uh, former border patrol agent. Oh, see? Is that interesting? I mean, I, I would have had no idea. There you go, a border patrol agent, and now she's in the legal profession. Okay. I'm telling you, you go down that, that road with somebody in a conversation, you get some interesting stories. They love to tell you about it. Then they'll tell their, you know, the story of why I went to law school and all that kind of stuff, right? So that's vocations. And I might ask it this way. Again, I bridged into it because... Uh, you know, we're pretending that I knew he was a professor. But let's say I didn't know anything about it. I would say, hey, Scott, so what do you do with most of your time? I work most of the time. Okay. And tell me where, what's your profession or line of work? I'm a professor at Baylor Law School. Oh, okay. Good. So you see, I ask, how do you spend most of your time? Most people will take that to mean you're, they're asking me, what do I do for a living? However, it's not always the case. I asked a lady one time, and I knew she worked full time. But her answer was, I spend it with my two daughters. Now, I knew she worked full time. She said, I spend it with, with my two daughters. What did that tell me in big neon letters about her? What was important in her life? Bingo. So what do you think I'm going to do next? Right? Oh, really? Tell me about your daughters. Oh, they're 9 and 12. And nine, you know. Well, what activities are they in there? I'm telling you, people love to talk about their kids, their grandkids. If you, you get them going there, and then you could come back around to, well, tell me what line of work you're in, okay? Um, you know, if that surfaces. It doesn't have to surface. If all we did was talk about West Texas for 35 minutes, you know, before dinner started, a huge rapport. That's all it takes. But I'm taking you through the whole thing here. So that's vocations. So what do you do with most of your time? Just very casual. What do you do with most of your time? Oh, I work. Man, I work too much. And oh, okay, what kind of learn what kind of what line of work are you on? Boom. It's not what do you do? And by the way, we're not asking what uh, I should have said at the, at the beginning. The thing about asking people what they do in America, in the go-go, ambitious, um, rugged individualism that is the Western world, and I'm a fan of it, all right. Um, Sometimes we get into this mode where we are what we do, all right? My personal philosophy, in my opinion, that's not healthy long-term, okay? So by, not, by asking someone, hey, what do you do? You're really tacitly or implicitly saying, I'm about to size you up by what you tell me, the answer to that question. Nobody wants to be sized up that way. Scott's from West Texas. Okay, he's a lawyer, that's okay, because he's from West, I'm just kidding, because he's from West <laughs> Texas, I see that rapport's already built. Doesn't matter what he does after that. I mean, I can't imagine what you'd do that would offend anyone, but the point is that it's, it's for their good too. You're telling them something about yourself when you don't come right out and say, what do you do? You're saying, I know that you're not just what you do. 
Right? It's who you are that I want to know about. And what you do goes along with that. And it's important, it's very important, but I'm more interested in who you are. Okay. And then the A in LAVA, L-A-V-A, this acronym, is avocations, just a, family, uh, a uh, fancy word for hobbies and interests. Okay. So after we've talked about locations and family and associations and who he knows here and vocations and his history and all this kind of stuff, then I'll say, well, Scott, what do you do for fun? Do you, what do you do in your free time? I recently took up tennis. Okay. I'm taking tennis lessons out at uh, Ridgewood Country Club. Oh, well, good for you. You know, I, for 10 years, I played tennis three times a week. Really? Like it was a religion. Yeah. Uh, you know, out, out of college. I mean, I, I played when I was younger, not competitively, but I, I got down to a 4-0. You know, that's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. I'm a 50 now, probably, but I got down to a 40. That's how much I, and it was just from sheerly playing, probably too much for my wife's, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> taste. But anyway, uh, yeah, man, tennis. I used to watch all the tournaments. Wimbledon. Went to Wimbledon, one of the greatest days of my life. Got to sit at center court for three pounds. I'd love to go someday. Because they did the, you know. All right, what's going on here? Sorry, I forgot you guys were here for a second. Huh? Tennis. I don't play tennis now. Joints are all worn out. Okay, but I did. Again, we could talk another 20 minutes about tennis. Who do you yeah. think the best? Is it Sampras or uh, the guy from Switzerland? I can't even think of his name right now. Um, it's the guy from Switzerland. Yeah. What's the guy's name? Anybody? Uh, Federer. Thank you, yeah. Federer. I'm so Sampras or Federer? Nice. It's clearly Federer. It's Federer. Yeah. You know, labor they use wooden rackets, right? Here's the point. We're building. In fact, you and I are building even more rapport because you're telling me some things. I know. I've seen even, stuff I didn't know. Yeah, we've done this uh, a couple times and I've learned some new stuff. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. You got a neighbor? Let's have a lava conversation right now. And then you're going to tell me what you learned from them. So just whoever's closest to you or you're on the rows. We have an even number. So it's perfect. Nisi, you want to? Would you mind? Gentleman over here. Just real quick, four or five minutes. All right, if we make our way back to your seats, please. Make your way back. All right. I would, uh, I saw a lot of smiles and laughing and uh, good conversations going on. Tell me maybe what you were feeling, or if you'd like to share something that you learned about someone in the room, please, please do. Yes, sir. He was born in Panama. Oh, okay. And the reason that he was born there was his father worked uh, for the military at the time, and they were there as part of the deal with Panama to okay. build the canal. All right, nice. I read a book about the, the construction of the Panama Canal. It's unbelievable what they had to go through to get that done, right? Uh, now, if I were having a conversation, I only mention that because one of the 12 keys that we're not going to go over, by the way, is, is reading, uh, is reading, uh, lifelong learning and reading. Uh, because I'd read a book there, you and I could talk about that. So if it, uh, what's your first name over there, Nicholas? Yeah, if it, was, if it were you and I, I would carry on that conversation. Did you have any experience with Panama that you shared? Okay, all right, but that was an interesting fact, obviously, and you, you know, just looking at the guy, you couldn't guess that he was uh, born in Panama. Military family, correct? Okay, excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Who else would like to share? Yes, ma'am. Well, what we learned is both of us live in unincorporated areas that are subject to annexation. Okay. And <laughs> even with the new passing of the law, Neither one of us are protected with the right to vote. We so, down a hole <laughs> seriously, we learned a lot about each other with that one. I mean, what are the chances that's what you have in common? That, that, did, do you know? Did you know each other? Okay, you, did you know each other before you came here today? Yes. Oh, okay, but you didn't know that about him. No, I was going to book Well, there you go. That's the other thing I failed to mention that you think you know someone. Until you have this conversation, then you learn all kinds of things about it. I mean, it happens over and over and again. And this is what I was telling you when we were in China. It was the same way. Kids loved it, high five, laughing. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. All right, well, thank you for that. Someone else want to share? Yes, sir. Let's go to our Aggie. 
We found out that uh, Daniel's in the Army National Guard, and I want to join the State Guard afterwards, okay. and we both really appreciate the Texas gun culture. Oh, there you go. Now, are you from Texas originally? Yes, sir. Okay. And you as well? No, no. New Jersey. New Jersey. Okay. Interesting. So my son is in the Corps Cadets at A&M, and he's going to take an Army contract. So if I were having that conversation with either one of you, that, you know, we would be having that conversation and making that connection. Okay. And obviously, you made the connection. That's great. Yeah. One more. Do you see anything? What, what did you guys learn over here? Yes, I had a delightful conversation right. with Jose. Okay. And, uh, in Spanish or English? In English. Okay. But of course, we got to that. Because <clears throat> his background is, is it on? His yeah. background is, um, his family is of Mexican origin, okay. and my family is of Cuban origin, so we discussed that. But Jose was also in the military and uh, served 15 years and was military police and uh, was in Alaska, did two tours in Iraq, I believe, um, and then came back and went to college and law school. And he already has a, and he just took the bar, woohoo, and yeah. uh, has already started a nonprofit and has oh, written wow. two children's books that are illustrated for diversity in children's books. So I was fascinated talking to him. I, I asked him most of the questions. And um, so he wants to start, go out on his own, but he's already doing a lot of other yeah. things. So See, how cool is that? You just never know. Children's books, illustrated? Oh, you do the illustrations as well? Yes. How cool is that? And thank you for your service. Yes, yeah. and of course I told him our youngest son was ah, wanting to so, take a contract in the connection. Army. So Okay, yeah. what's happened? I'm telling you, I know I made this up, but I think it's magical. I think when this kind of stuff happens. Now, I want you to tell me what kind of application could this possibly have in your profession? Anyone? Networking, uh, just dealing with talking with clients, everything. Okay, so networking, just take that category for, you know, you probably want some people to refer to you, whatever your specialty is, right? I'm assuming that maybe referrals is good, okay? You know, unless you're a corporate attorney on staff or something, you, you, you want referrals. Uh, great, and then with clients. That's where I really, uh, networking's important. That's a no-brainer. I know you get this for networking. But I want you to do with this with clients. And, and I had a, a financial planning firm, a boutique firm in Dallas for 32 years. And we institutionalized this across the board. In other words, we would build mind maps in our client profiles. And we had 300 clients, so we couldn't remember them all. They didn't know that. They think we did. But we had that institutional for everybody to view. And so when that client came in, guess what was happening, right? The, the receptionist that was greeting them would say, hey, how's John doing at Clemson? Oh, well, you know, he's doing great. He's only got one more year. You know, he just graduated. And they're thinking, how did they even, it's been a year and a half since I came in here for a review. I'm, I'm six months late. Uh, and then they go in and, hey, tell me about how that, you know, how's the ranch project going? Well, the ranch project's going great. Thanks for, you know. It, they're almost in this mode of, this person really knows me. Even if they don't have that cognitive, conscious thought, subconsciously they're thinking, this person loves me, they like me, they care about who I am, not just that I can, you know, they're going to get a fee off of me because I'm a client. Yes, sir. Jim, the other place where this technique can be really useful is in uh, picking a jury. Mm. Depending on how much leeway the judge gives you, um, having an approach to a juror that will really open them up to you know something about them and who they are as a person is a great thing. Yeah, that, thank you for that. You know, I, uh, and I would not have brought that up because I'm not in your profession and wouldn't have known that as nuanced as you do, but that makes perfect sense. You want to build some rapport with the jury, I'm assuming. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, I, I know that much. Um, excellent, thank you for that. Yeah, good. So here's what I want you to do. I don't, want, I don't want you to ever ask somebody, what do you do again? Okay, they may ask you that, but don't you ask them that. And try to get in there first and say, I don't think we've met. I'm so-and-so. And I think what you'll find is this is, a, this is a pretty nice way to interact with people. It's pleasant. It's fun. You learn so many things like you just experienced, and it builds instant rapport, and, and that's a key. Teach it to your kids. Teach it to your grandkids, if and when you have those. Um, teach it to your associates, your partners, whoever it might be, uh, and see what happens. Okay, so that is one of the 12 
Uh, we call it the lava conversation, building instant rapport. I forgot to tell you about Batman up here. Uh, any Superman fans in here? I didn't bring Superman in here. I usually do, but didn't know what my space was or anything. So, so any Superman fans? Okay, you know he can't do really what he says he can do. That's, that's fake. And I know this guy's fake too, but here's the difference between Batman and Superman. He could do that. What, why could he do that? And I'm talking about the old school Batman, this one, not, that, not the dark knight new guy. I don't, he creeps me out a little bit. <laughs> but what is it about him? Why could he do that? He didn't need superpowers, yeah? Uh, two things, he has the motivational background from his parents. Ah. Yes, the resources. Okay, so that's interesting. You have a lava on Batman enough to know, right? That his parents, what happened to his parents? Uh, they were killed. Yes, yeah, they were killed. They were mugged in Central, you know, Central yeah. Park, you know, so to speak. Right, so you're a fan. That's good. So you know that about him, and you know they left him a lot of money, right? Okay, so excellent. What does he have, though, that enables him to do all his... Wonderful crime fighting activities. Huh? Besides money, what does he do with that money? The belt. The belt! Which have what in them? Tools. Tools. You can't see them all, there's 12, right? They go around all the way. Okay, so one of his two, if you're Batman, one of your 12 tools is lava. Okay, so that's why Batman's here, and <clears throat> plus a lot of people like to take a picture with him, so. That's, uh, in fact, Scott's trying to take him home, and I said, no, that's not going to work. But I think they're 79 bucks on uh, Amazon or whatever. All right, let's go to a second one. Uh, time leadership. We normally think of this as time management. We've got seven time leadership concepts. I'm only going to have time to give you two, ironically. We've got to take care of you, manage our time here. But I want to give you two that I think would help you as I kind of think through what you're doing for a living. Um, the first one is not so popular, but I'll tell you a story to maybe help a little bit. So back in 1912, there was a guy named Ivy Lee. And he was uh, one of the top management consultants in the United States. He had a client named Charles Schwab. Now, this is the, like the granddad or the great granddad of the Charles Schwab that you know, you've seen on TV commercials. He was in the steel business. And so he went to Ivy League, called him in, and he said, look, my managers are not getting it done. There's so much wasted time, and we're losing money because of it. Time is money. Can you help me? Uh, give me an idea that will help make us more efficient. And Ivy Lee said, OK. Schwab said, how much am I going to owe you for this? He said, don't worry about it. That's a bad sign for Schwab, isn't it? Or, and so Ivy Lee went away and said, I'll be back in three months with the idea. Walked the floor of the plants, interviewed people, studied what was going on in the company, cogitated for three months about it, came back, said, all right, Mr. Schwab, I've got it. All right, Mr. Lee, tell me what you've got. He said, at the beginning of each day, I want every manager to write down the six most important tasks they need to do for the next day. I want them to do it the day before. Then the next day, they go through those, ta those uh, tasks in priority order, and anything that was not done is moved to the top of the list the next day. Now, that's not creating an iPhone. That's not rocket science. That was the idea. In 1912, that was a revolutionary idea. We think of it, that's just a to-do list, right? It's a task list. But back then, it was revolutionary. Schwab paid him $25,000, which was about $515,000. I did the inflation uh, in today's money for three months' work. That's a pretty good consulting check, all right? Went on to use it. It worked great for him. The key to that if we go back and analyze it closely, the key was the night before, okay? Here's what happens in our hurried world with all the electronic, you know, it's this tyranny of the rectangles. I heard a guy the other day call it the, rec the Bermuda rectangle. I love that, we're all in the Bermuda rectangle. 
we're so hurried that we just want to get to bed, get some rest, get up early in the morning, get things going. Here's why looking at those task lists, whatever they might be, I know you're not so fortunate that you only have six. Uh, none of us are. But let's just say there's six. By looking at those tasks the night before, your brain will sometimes do something amazing with those tasks. Because science has shown, research has shown, that when you go into REM sleep, R-E-M sleep, rapid eye movement, that what happens is your brain doesn't completely go to sleep. In fact, many times it's very active in the middle of the night, and it's working on things that you've been thinking about in your waking hours. You've heard, probably heard this before, right? <clears throat> Fairly well-known research. That's why when you wake up in the morning oftentimes, and you, your feet hit the floor and you go in and you get a first cup of coffee or you, you know, go to the restroom and run the water, you think, that's it. And then you have to go and write it down on your phone or whatever. Have you ever thought of ideas early, early in the morning? It happens to me all the time. I'll wake up thinking about something that I was troubled by or confused by or wondering about the day before. That's, what, that's anecdotal evidence. I'm not trying to pass that off as scientific evidence, although there is some. But that is something we've probably all experienced. So by looking at the task tomorrow, the cases tomorrow, whatever it is in, in your line of work, the night before, you're allowing your brain to, to go into overtime without you having to work overtime. Does that make sense? And same thing, if I'm teaching undergrad kids, I'll tell them the same thing. Don't get up early and study, the hard studying. Do the hard studying at night so your brain can work on it and just a light review in the morning. So you can, you can transcribe that concept to uh, the professional world as well. And so when you wake up with those ideas, I know that in your profession, like mine, those ideas could be the difference between winning a case or not, or picking the right 12th juror or not, or thinking of an innovative way to make this contract work or not. I mean, things are so close in life, right? We need all the help we can get. And so the idea here, again, is to do it the night before, and here's the other one that's not popular, okay? Doing the night before is not popular because what's one reason you might not want to look at the complicated things you've got to deal with tomorrow before you go to bed? Keep you up. That generally, in the reading I've done, is a fallacy. That it's better to know than to not know. In other words, not knowing everything about tomorrow can keep you up just as much as knowing. Right? Haven't you heard, you know, uh, you know, I don't want any bad news, but I'd rather know sooner rather than later so that we can get on top of it and get, you know. Same, same concept. The other one that is not popular in our day because of the technology uh, is the idea of doing it on paper. So that's the other part of this particular time leadership. Um, in my book, I have a, a photograph of Benjamin Franklin's daytimer. You know, when he would, um, by the way, which president, you know, he's on a $100 bill, which president was he, what order? Anybody know? Huh? Oh, he was president. Everybody's looking at me like, who is this guy? He was the sixth president of Pennsylvania. Anyway, it's true. A little trivia, you know, at a party if it's going slow or whatever. Um, but anyway, Ben Franklin, statesman, you know, working on the Constitution, you know, all the accolades, inventor, incredible inventor, if you've ever been through his museum in Philadelphia. But when he had introduced himself or signed his name, he always put printer, Benjamin Franklin, printer. So if I was having a lava, if I were having a lava conversation with him, he would have told me he was a printer. That's what he loved. And Franklin planner, okay, that's where that came from. Ben Franklin had a planner. It's an interesting photograph. I'll, I can show you too afterwards if you'd like to see it. But what's interesting is that he put everything. He put eat lunch, take a nap, go to sleep, wake up, do the books. I mean, everything was on there. And one thing that's intriguing is that at the top and the bottom of the daytimer page, at the top, he wrote a question. So it was printed, so it was there every day. And he asked himself, what good shall I do this day? So that's the first thing he looked at on his paper day planner. And then at the bottom, the question was, what good have I done this day? Isn't that interesting? And so 
by going back to paper, here's what happens. And I have an iPad. You probably saw it up here. I've got an iPhone. I love the electronics. I've got 500 books on my iPad that I could refer to anytime I want to. So we're not against the technology. It's just that by going to paper also, and this is a trend. There's lots of articles about this in recent years, kind of a backlash, I think, against technology. But if you go to the paper, what happens is, for example, in college, studies have shown that if you take notes on paper versus typing them, you're five times more likely to remember the information. Why is that? Anybody know? Yes? Because there's a connection between writing, the physical act of writing, and imprinting it on your brain. That's it. Yeah, there is a muscle, uh, memory, if you will, kind of connection. That's half of it. What's the other part? When you're typing notes, what's going on in your brain versus when you're writing notes? Well, let me ask you this. Can you type faster or write faster? Type. type. Yes. Uh, I can't remember how much faster, but it's like 1.7 times faster, something like that. But yes, you can type faster. So when you're typing, you're going faster. Well, it makes sense. I, you know, I can get more down if I'm typing. When you're writing, what's going on in, in your brain? Say it again. You're thinking about it more. Why? It's slower. It's a much longer process and has time to sit on your brain. OK, and? You have to summarize or condense the key points. Bingo. If you're a trial lawyer, I think that's important to be able to summarize the key points, right? Okay, so can you see the, you know, that's what you're doing when you're writing. So when you write it at night, it's going into your brain deeper for the same reasons that Scott just, just talked about. And if it's longhand notes instead of typing, you're thinking about it. I don't know. I'm, again, I'm not an attorney. I, I would think that if I were and I was really into just training attorneys, I might say, hey, maybe you ought to write out your closing argument, or write out, you know, just to, you know, get it in your brain. But anyway, <clears throat> plan your day the night before. Think about getting in that habit. It's not for everybody, but I think it is for most people. And thinking about having an analog or a paper day timer in addition to. Also, the other thing about electronic day timer, I mean, this is the way it has been with me. You put the electronic task in there, where do they go? I have no idea where they go. Do you? I mean, they go into the machine. But there's so many in there, sometimes they never come out. They get lost in there. Whereas it is with paper, it's annoying to have to write it again on the next day, isn't it? So what maybe you might do is you might say, OK, I just don't need to do that. I'm going to mark it off once and for all. Or by gum, I'm going to get it done so I don't have to write it again. It's annoying. I, I, I found that annoying myself like that actually makes me better at organization. So that's one of the uh, seven that I can tell you today. The second one that I'll tell you today is to work in time blocks. So this is where the technology is really cool. Uh, and in fact, you can see here, you know I'm not going over, because we're working in a time block. I had an hour and a half time block. We got 35 minutes and 26 seconds left. <clears throat> and so I'm very cognizant of this. And because the graphics are so cool, when I, when I was in college, many decades ago, literally, I was a runner. At, so I went from running to tennis, to golf, to now, you know, if I can walk around the neighborhood, it's good. But when I was a, a runner, <clears throat> I had a Casio watch that had a stopwatch on it, and it had a, count, a, a timer, like this, OK? Remember those plastic watches? And then I had a Walkman uh, that went over my head, and it went on two A batteries, and it was a cassette tape, right? That's how long ago that was, when I was jogging. And so <clears throat> I, I liked the, the clock that, that went backwards so much that I started using it for studying. OK, I've got an hour and a half before the game starts. I'm going to study, and I, and I would count backwards studying. My friends made fun of me. I was, you know, thought that was kind of nerdy, but it worked for me. And then what happens? The Apple people come out with these beautiful graphics on iPads and phones, and there it is. There's that counter that I used back when it wasn't popular. And so I'll tell you what I teach college kids, and then you make the application. <clears throat> when they need to study three subjects in the evening, for example, I tell them, look, 
If you've got three hours, you've got three subjects, work 50 minutes, put 50 minutes on that iPhone clock. At the end of 50-50 minutes, you get 10 minutes and it's party time. Go get your phone, text everybody, catch up, emails, 10 minutes, and then boom, back to a 50-minute time block. Because what are kids doing now? And I'm going to make the application of the working world in just a second. What are they doing now? What are, some of you have kids. When they study, what are they doing? Yes, ma'am. Oh, gosh. Yeah, they're playing Fortnite. But why are they able to play Fortnite? Because they have their, yeah, they're not putting it arm's length away, right? So they're sitting there with their electronics. And how, how long do they go before they get a text on average? What would you guess? I don't know the answer, but what, what can we guess? Maybe a minute. Same with us, right? A lot of times, we're the same way. OK. You cannot study. You cannot get into a deep study pattern where you're learning the material if you're interrupted every minute or two, or even if it's five or six minutes. You just can't do it. So what are they doing? They're either spreading out their study time, or more likely than not, they're not studying as they should. Okay. You probably learned this by experience, because to get through law school, I have to assume you had to get some study habits in place or it's just not going to happen, right? All the reading that I know you have to do, just because I've heard. But kids in, in college don't understand that. Once they go to this time block method, then it allows them to get into deep thinking and deep studying, and they actually reduce their study time. I, I tell them, look, I'm going to give you a secret where you can have more time to have more fun. Anybody against that? Okay. And that's the key. Now, same thing in the office. You're there at 8 o'clock in the morning. You, you got four and a half hours until a lunch meeting, let's say. OK? Well, you're putting 90 minutes on the clock, or 80 minutes on the clock. And you're doing that task, that Ivy Lee task list that I talked about that you slept on last night and prioritized. By the way, it's important to prioritize it the night before, too, because that allows you to think about the most important things. But anyway, um, that 90 minute or 80 minute time block, it works the same for you in the office. You close the door, you say, I'm diving in, no interruptions. Okay, I'm gonna do the first time block before I even check email. Okay, get in there early. I'm telling you, you'll, you'll be amazed at how much more production you can have. And if you wanna pass this on to associates, your entire team can have that same kind of uh, increase. I, uh, I did a thing called uh, the, re the traffic light system for my team 10 years ago. And I, I'd read a book or something, and I said, you know, I'm just curious. Let's track our time, the whole team, individually. Track your time for two weeks. And it's either going to be green time, yellow time, or red time. I think this might apply to this group. All right, green time. Green is money. Okay, green, I'm in front of a client, or I'm talking on, to a client on the phone, or I'm talking to a prospective client, all right, it's somehow going to end up direct money creation, okay? Yellow time is administration. It's required. You can't get rid of all the yellow time. You can minimize it, make it more efficient, but I'm going to have some yellow time. That's fine. Just track it, okay? And what's red time? Eh, that's standing around the water cooler when you shouldn't. That's just, you know, taking a two-hour lunch when you should have taken a 45-minute lunch. That's just wasted time, and we just tracked it. And at the end of two weeks, we were able to reduce our red and yellow time, which is then filled in with what? Green time. We reduced red and yellow combined by 30% just by looking at it. So a lot in life is just observation, right? Uh, when I was in high school, one of the silly things we always told each other, the guys that ran around together, we always said, hey, observation is the key to life. We had no idea what that meant. We just thought it sounded smart. And now I've come to realize <laughs> observation is the key to life. And that's what this is. Time blocks, observing, just making yourself aware of it will make you more efficient. Okay. So we've talked about building instant rapport. We've talked about a couple of time management uh, tips. Again, there's some more that we just unfortunately don't have time uh, to get into. But I also promised you that we would talk about building relationships. Right? So whether it's with a referral source in your line of law, um, with your family, with your in-laws, with friends, with your church community, it doesn't matter. 
building relationships uh, is not as difficult as people make it. And the reason why we don't build the kinds of relationships that maybe we could or should is because we don't take the time to do it, right? We're so busy. That's really the watchword of our generation. So I want to give you a practical suggestion. Again, nothing new, but maybe I'm going to remind you of something. When we communicate with people, when we connect with people, right? I want to use that word. So I want to think of connectivity in terms of relationships, not in terms of hooking up our computers with one another, OK? If you have a scale of connect, connectivity or connectivity, what's the least connecting way that we could communicate one to, you know, with each other in our day and time? The least, OK, of all the modes of connecting, text and email and phone and so on and so forth. What's the least connecting in terms of building a relationship? What do you think it might be? I'm going to give it a 1 on a scale of 1 to 10. Say it again. Facts? What, I don't even know what that is. What? Yeah, I don't, I don't do that anymore, but that gets a zero. OK, so what's above facts? Email. No, it's next. Text. text. All right, so text gets a 1 out of 10. Why is text not that connecting? Now, I know the emojis and the cartoons. My kids built a cartoon of me, and they think it's funny and all that stuff. <laughs> so do you. Uh, but anyway, uh, just a normal text, what are the limits of that? Well, I mean, you can't really communicate too well okay. in a text. But the other is the reader's only looking at it for one second, put it down, uh -huh. and it's now into something else. Okay, right. So there's no focus on it. Okay. Um, yeah, you really can't get much out of it. Have you ever miscommunicated with a text? Okay, that ought to tell you that it's not very connecting, right? Okay, so let's give it a 1 out of 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. Text. What's next right here? I can't see your name, but you just... Next would probably be email because it's still in written word, not oral. You can't get yeah. uh, body, you know, you can't get in tone or... or right. That is the correct answer. It is email. I'm going to give it a 3 on a scale of 1 to 10. You can send it to a lot more people. You can make it a lot longer. I know you can do long text, but everybody gets annoyed with those. But you can put a lot more information. You can put your nice little picture down at the bottom with your company logo, attachments. It's just more versatile. Okay, what's next after email if we're going up that scale of connecting with people? Yes? Phone call. That's it. Phone call. I'm going to give that a 6 out of 10. What changes with a phone call? And we, we don't even answer our phone anymore, do we? Look at it and see who it is and let it go to voicemail. More cues. Tone is the most important aspect of, of communication. If I had screamed everything I've told you today, we would have a different atmosphere in here. If I'd whispered it, we'd have a different atmosphere. So tone is what you get. And you get the real time. Cues is, what, is the way you put it. Uh, that's right. Okay. So that's a six out of 10. What's next? Yes? I'm thinking Skype or something like that where you can add in the body language. Okay. Uh, Skype is next. It gets a seven out of 10. However, body language is actually limited. What, let's go ahead and jump to the next one. So after Skype or video conference, what would become next? We're going up the scale. Face-to-face. Face-to-face. Huh? Face-to-face, what we're doing right here. Okay. Why is face-to-face -face going to get a 9 out of 10 versus uh, teleconferencing getting a 7? You can see, you know, basically their head or their right. chest up. Yeah. Right. So those that are watching on video right now might be seeing the same thing you're seeing, but there's one important thing they're not seeing. They can't really see the whites of my eyes. The whites of our eyes are amazing. Even on the back row, I can tell where you're looking right now just by the sliver of the white in your eyes. And no matter how good video is, there's something lost there. And I'm cut off. Normally in a video conference, I would be cut off. And so you would not get all of the body language. And there's a lot of important body language from here down, isn't there? Yeah. Have my hands are crossed, legs. You know, is my knee going up and down real nervously? Things like that. OK. So what's a 10? We're missing something. I mean, I'm face to face. What more can I do here? There is a 10. 
It's old school. I played high school football. We were really close in the locker room. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, if you and I were to do it like a body high five, that that's a 10 right there. No. Is there a reason your wife is here? <laughs> uh, well, there's, there's always a reason my wife is here, yeah. Um, anybody? A 10? Yes, sir. Just like one-on-one -on -one talking? No. Closer. I love the fact that we're, we're having to think about this a second. Makes it even better. Is it touch? It's not touch, but maybe that's a nine and a half. It is a handwritten note. Nothing connects people like a handwritten note. And what's interesting is that we're so far away from that. I know y'all write handwritten notes. Obviously, I'm not saying that. But we're so far away from that kind of thinking that it didn't even come up in this conversation. And so what's happened is it's opened up this opportunity for those that will write handwritten notes. Uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln was famous for writing notes and putting them in his top drawer and never sending them. Do you know that? But then he also sent 20,000 notes that we know of uh, during his presidency. Thomas Jefferson did the same thing. Uh, Mother Teresa did the same thing. Clinton, uh, Bush the Elder, a lot of folks that are very successful and well-known have been all about the handwritten note. Have you ever gotten a handwritten note for some, from somebody famous? I have some on my iPad. I'd show you if I had time, but I'm a big basketball fan. And I got a, a handwritten note from the coach of the Celtics, uh, the young guy. Uh, his name is escaping me. Who's the basketball fan in here? Brad Stevens. Brad Stevens, yeah. On uh, Celtic on a Celtic card, I've got it, and I'm saving it because if he wins the NBA championship or becomes a Hall of Fame coach, which he might because yeah. he's that good, I got that, right? And I've gotten some others, uh, and I'm sure you have too, but what happens when you get a note from somebody famous? You don't throw it away, right? What happens when you get a note from somebody that you care about? What do you do with it? You keep it. I got drawers full in my office and at my home. You keep it. Why? Dear to you. Um, but what's what's dear about it? What's different about it? What's unique? Um, I guess it, it just shows uh, that it's more personal. Okay. Uh, that someone actually took their time to to actually sit down, think about the words mm -hmm. that they want to express. And right. Yeah. So we talked about writing versus typing. All right. If you're going to write, you don't want to have to write it over. So what are you going to do? You're going to think about it a lot before you start writing. Okay, number one, your handwriting is like a fingerprint. Nobody's handwriting is like yours. Even if it's bad, people like the fact that it's your handwriting. My oldest son, you know, I peppered him with this when he was in high, when, you know, college. And he goes, oh, you know, my handwriting's horrible. And it was. He was right. It was terrible. Six months after he started working, and he was doing this, you know, very consistently to prospective clients, he came back and he, he showed me an email somebody sent. And in that email, they said, your handwriting is so nice. And I said, see there? Because what happens is it improves. Your handwriting improves as you use it. Okay. What else about it? So you hit on a couple. Tell me your name again. I'm sorry. Priscilla. Priscilla. Okay. Thank you, Priscilla. So Priscilla came up with a couple that your handwriting is, uh, and you have to think about it. And one other thing you said that was very important is time. It shows you took the time. There's no greater gift we can give one another than our time. Wouldn't you agree? You're charging for time, so you think it's important, right? So do I. Time is the thing that we all have in common. We all have 24-7 in a day. And the fact that you took 15 minutes to, get the, to go buy the card, so let's average out the time. So at some point, you had to buy the card or order it. Get it, get the materials out, write it, think about it, and then go to the mailbox, make sure you had the right stamp, send it. These things take time. So what you're saying to the person implicitly is that you were important enough to me that I took time out of my day to do this to make sure you knew how important I thought you were. 
It's not the words themselves, because you could send those same words in a text or an email or on the phone, right? It's that you took the time, and you know they won't throw it away, right? Mark Twain famously said that compliments might hang around for two months, but cards and letters hang around forever. Yeah. So think about it. You're the professional that sends a handwritten note. Your clients are going to get the note, and they're going to how, how did she have time to, to, you know, to do? Well, you've got a system where your, you know, your staff is helping you make, make this happen. Okay. Uh, let me give you a, a few things that I, that I use and tell folks. Um, my card is uh, a parchment type. It's kind of rough around the edges, so I want some you know, kind of manly looking uh, card here. Also, uh, our founding documents are on this kind of, of paper. Right? Uh, I always put a quote or a passage of something that I know will connect with the person receiving the card. This one says, this is just a sample I did many years ago, attitude determines altitude. Well, that's something you could send to anybody, especially if you're trying to encourage young people, right? I know you're struggling, but attitude determines altitude. How would I know what to put here? Whom might I quote here after I've had a certain conversation? How would I know what to put here? What if I know they're a tennis fan? What might I put here? From who? The Swedish guy. The Swiss guy. Federer, right? If I had found out his favorite tennis player and I quoted him here and then said, hey, I, three sentences, I really enjoyed getting crossing paths the other day. I wish you the best this school year as it starts. You know, let's talk again soon. Just that quick. And then a quote here, if, if Federer had said altitude determines, or attitude determines altitude, I promise you Federer believes that or he wouldn't be the greatest tennis player of all time, right? What kind of connection would that have? He would say, I can't believe, A, that he took the time, that he quoted a guy that just in passing I told him was one of my heroes. What would you think about that, Scott? You can't help but be impressed, right? And so you've done a lava on a client. The client may think they're nobody. I'm just glad this attorney saw me, right? And then you take the time to do something like that, or you have your staff help you do that. Hey, I want the, in fact, we've developed a day timer at the old school, hopefully to have it published in January, because it's taken a while to get it together. And on every page, there's a quote. So if you can't think of a quote, you've got a whole day timer full of quotes right there. Right, August 8th, here's the quote, or 16th, here's the quote. So a passage at the top, that's why I like a folding one, uh, and then three sentences at the bottom. Doesn't need to be any more than that, just a greeting. Really appreciate the time you gave me and the consideration. Uh, hope you have a great school year. Look forward to crossing paths again. Best regards, Jim. Done. I use uh, paper sack envelopes. That's old school, right? It's material made out of old paper sacks from me getting from the grocery store. Uh, and then on the back, I put a wax seal. Do you know how many people have ever received a card with an actual wax seal on it? That's technically plastic. It's not wax, but it looks like wax. And so you can see, if you, came, if you looked at it, you'd see my old school logo, like is at the bottom of Abe Lincoln there. It's right there in the middle of that. I usually intentionally mess it up a little bit so they know I didn't just buy it as a sticker and that I actually did get the gun out, you know, it takes two minutes, right? And people, I'll get more emails back. I can't, I have never received anything with a wax seal. Guess what they get in the mail within a week when I get a compliment like that? Guess what they get from me? They, they get their own wax seal. Four bucks on Amazon, their last name's initial. They get that in the mail. Now, do you think I'm going to get any business from them? Maybe not, but I sure enjoy doing it. You know, it makes me feel good, right? And I know a lot of times you never hear from people. I always tell people, look, Jesus healed 10 lepers, and one came back to say thank you. So why should I get, you know, why should I expect any more than that? I'm not healing anybody. Uh, but all, many times they'll say thank you, and it's just really builds, continues to build that relationship. So a handwritten note, believe it or not, because it's gone out of style or because 
people have forgotten about it. If you bring it back in, you're going to stand out. Also, never put a meter on it. <clears throat> I always, you know, the post office has so many cool stamps. These are old Ford pickup trucks. Okay, uh, this is a Purple Heart. My our our youngest son was applied for an internship. It was very competitive. He went to the office, did a lava on him in the interview, noticed on the wall two framed Purple Heart certificates. Asking him about it, they talked about you know service, et cetera. And he came back and told me about it, and I said, so what are you going to do? He goes, I'm going to put a Purple Heart on the card that I send him. I said, no, you're not. You're going to put two Purple Hearts. And he did, and guess what? He got the internship. Do I know that's why? No, the guy never told him that's why, never, you know. But if nothing else, it's honoring that guy, right? If I know somebody's had a Purple Heart, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I get a Purple Heart or some other kind of military because there's other stamps that are honor the military. Check this one out, old baseball stadiums, all the old school baseball stadiums. Any baseball, right? I bet there's a tennis stamp. I haven't actually looked. But if I sent you that card, Federer with a tennis ball stamp, right? And then I, I usually spend a lot more time talking about Batman with, uh, with the college kids, but <clears throat> we don't have that much time today. But guess what happens when they get it, right? There you go. Look, it's even the, the, uh, the bat signal is a postage stamp. How cool is that to get a, you know, I wish somebody would send me a Batman stamp. Anyway, so I know I spent a lot of time on that, but I really believe that it's that differentiating, those little things, right? The lava conversation, building this report, thinking about how you, how you manage your time or lead your schedule, not just manage it. Um, and then connect with people with handwritten notes. Not everybody, I know you don't have time to do that, but Man, when you do, it's going to make an impression. Family, friends, coworkers, uh, supervisors, clients, prospects, um, centers of influence that are sending you referrals, professor, you know, whoever it might be. I'm telling you, uh, they'll, they're going to love you uh, for it. And, you know, it'll, you can make it sincere. One last thing, I'll, uh, and then I'll open it up for just a couple of questions if anybody has one. Tell stories, right? In 1834, <clears throat> in the middle of Kentucky, there was a shopkeeper uh, who was just as poor as poor could be. And one day, a wagon came through town, man and his family, everything was loaded up. They had tried farming in eastern Kentucky and said, you know, they packed it up and said, it's not going to work. So they rode up, the shopkeeper was out on the porch just standing there, and the, the man in the wagon said, hey, I got a lot of stuff back here. I tried farming, didn't work out, but I got a lot of stuff here I can't use. Is there anything you'd like to buy you know, for your general store? And he said, no, no way. I mean, this guy owed money to five creditors. He was bankrupt himself, couldn't afford anything. Well, the guy in the wagon was persistent. He said, no, come on back and look here. And so they went back there and looked, and there was a barrel, you know, big like a, it was Kentucky. It was probably a big bourbon, empty bourbon barrel, but it was full of junk. And he said, take this barrel. There may be something in there you want. 50 cents. You can use it for storage. And so finally, just to get rid of the, the ex-farmer, he said, okay, here you go. 50 cents, I'll take it. Took it and put it in the corner for months until finally he said, you know, I actually need that barrel for storage, so I'm going to go over there uh, and see what's going on. So... He looked over there, and there was just junk in this barrel, and so he had to get it all. He dumped it over once it got light enough to do so, and he threw it all out. And in the bottom of that barrel was one book, Blackstone. Does that sound familiar? What's it called, Blackstone? What's it technically called? Blackstone's, uh, you guys have all read it. Nisi, what is it? Yeah, he was a legal. Oh, right. the, he's the does the legal dictionaries now. Yeah, but it was the quintessential law book of the day. It was in the bottom of that barrel. The guy took it out, started reading it, and he became the 16th president of the United States. Without that barrel, there's no Abe Lincoln. Without Abe Lincoln, there's no Gettysburg. 
without Gettysburg, there's no United States of America to stand up to Hitler during World War II. There is no telling how much different this world would be if it weren't for a persistent farmer from Eastern Kentucky in 1834 that made a skinny 24-year-old shopkeep, broke as broke could be, buy a barrel and look in the bottom of it. So, you know, doesn't that give new meaning to, I think we're scraping the bottom of the barrel, right? So, <laughs> so don't ever look at that as negative again, right? Well, the story I just told you, I, maybe you've heard it, I don't know. Maybe a few of you have heard it. But that story brings people in, and that means something to you, because it truly, without that, in Gettysburg, there is no telling what would be going on on this planet right now. Uh, and things happen. And so what's going to happen as you accumulate stories, we encourage, when I work with companies, we encourage them to create what we call a story vault. In other words, stories that are either outside of their company that they can make points with. And I've got a thousand of them on my iPad, by the way, uh, from all different subjects. Or maybe they're an accumulation of all the stories of your clients in your particular specialty. You know, I've, I've dealt with this, Bob. I think we've had 107 cases that are almost just like this one. In fact, one in particular, and you tell them, no names obviously, what does that do for the client? You know what? I, I, I get it. You give me confidence, let's go for it. We're going to win the, you know, here we go. I'm telling you, stories is the most efficient way to communicate. It's the most motivational. It's aspirational. It's inspirational. And uh, so the story vault, I do a whole class on that, but I just mention it. Uh, so that you'll do it. Chapter 5 in my book is all about storytelling. Okay, let's open it up. Uh, we've got five, maybe three minutes of questions. I've got a couple things I'd like to give out, and then, uh, yeah. Oh, yes. I'm just going to remind myself of okay. you guys, uh, Blackstone was the commentaries, uh, Blackstone's was the commentaries of the laws of England. They're, they were an influential 18th century treatise on the common law in England. There you go. Didn't everybody have to read Blackstone? Or seems like it. Thankfully, no. Say it again. Oh, you didn't? Oh, OK. All right. Uh, any questions? I'm just looking for something real quick while I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to take a question. All right, let's start with the second question. Back here in the back. Yeah, I'm just going to go back to what you said uh, earlier. You said that ideally you would start the conversation with someone when you were initiating a lava conversation, but there was a creative way you can handle the what do you do uh, question. Yeah. Um, you know what? I actually have something written down here. I just want to make sure that I uh, give it to you correctly. Um, when someone, give me 20 seconds. Uh, I wasn't prepared for that question, but thank you for that question. I should have been prepared. Stranger, so Jim, what do you do? It's like, dang it, I didn't get out there and get my hand in Scott, you know, soon enough, and Scott's asked me, what, it, what do I do? Um, well, you know how many people are, uh, in this generation are distracted with all the technology and all that kind of stuff? And Scott would say, man, do I. Good grief. You know, my kids and my grandkids and everybody is. Uh, so you're going to say, yeah, no kidding. And then I would say, well, I run a company called The Old School that goes to universities and companies around the country, and I try to teach them how not to be in that trap. Okay. So what I did there was, when I'm asked, I ask a question back. Right? You guys know this. When you're in trouble, always ask a question. Right? Because then that gives you time to think, if nothing else, of what you're going to say next. Uh, so that's what you do. Uh, you, you say, well, you know, uh, I mean, uh, what, what specialty of law are you in or would you like to be in? Uh, business litigation. Business what? Litigation. Okay, business litigation. Uh, so if we were developing that answer for you, you might say something like, well, you know, like uh, when, when you see a company, which side are you on? Are you defending or are you going after them? Usually plaintiff. Uh, plaintiff? Okay. So you know when companies sometimes do something really stupid and it hurts people? Yeah, you know, and maybe you give them an example. 
that is, you know, in the current news setting. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. Well, I help those people. Yeah, I, you know, I try to make things right. Uh, and when they get in trouble and have problems in those areas, that's what we do. We help them. Okay, so you see how much different that is? Oh, you help people. Oh, you're a guy that helps people. Yeah, you know, my aunt had that problem. And again, I'm assuming that maybe there's a current event that, that, you, know, that you have referred to. And then boom. So you're the guy that helps instead of, well, I'm an attorney. Because that would be your natural answer. Well, I'm an attorney. Oh, well, what kind of attorney? And then here we go. We're just going down the same road. Whereas if you ask them a question, well, you know how when companies do this or that, this happens. Well, I step in and help those people. Okay. Again, I'm a little bit on the fly, but you kind of get that. Okay. Great question. Anytime you can stump the speaker, it's a good question. Or he has to go to his notes. All right. Time for another one. Excellent question. All right. Well, here's what I always tell any audience at the end. Um, first of all, because we're a small crowd here, uh, I don't know if any of you wear T-shirts. By the way, do we have any birthdays in here today? No birthdays? Okay. Any birthdays this month? August? Okay. All right. So you were kind enough, Nicholas, to answer a question. Here, I'm going to give you a choice. Did you go to Baylor Law School? Where did you go? Okay. Um, well, I've got Baylor colored shirts because I thought I was coming to Baylor. All right. So this is the... Um, this is the official old school t-shirt. So people love wearing these, uh, I've found, and they're so soft. In fact, feel how soft that is, all right? That'll be your favorite t-shirt, won't it? Okay, well, I've got a Baylor color one here. So here's the deal. You can either have my book that is full of incredible information like you've heard here today, times about 12, or you can have this wonderful, comfortable Baylor Law shirt. Which would you prefer? The book? Okay. Because you chose the book, guess what? You get both. Yeah. Is your name Solomon or Nicholas? Okay. All right. Good. Okay. You bet. I don't know if that's the right size, uh, but I have these shirts. If you don't like Baylor, just pretend you don't see the colors. Uh, but I've got enough for everybody. I'll just throw them on the table. If you'd like to have one, you're welcome to have one. Work out in it, so on and so forth. For my Aggie back there, it's not old school, right? It's old army. Okay. So I, so I, got, I probably have your size here. For, because you're my only Aggie. Any other Aggies in here? Oh, really? Okay. Well, come up and check and see if I've got your size. If I don't, I, I can make sure you get one. Um, okay, one more. Th can I, I got one minute. You according got. to my... I got one minute and six seconds on my time, my time block. Uh, Jose, thank you for serving. Anybody else serve uh, in the U.S. military? All right, good. Okay, well, hang on a second. One of the things about being in the military, you've got to be always prepared, so I am. So the last thing uh, we talk about, especially for our college kids, is that life is, and in a lot of ways it's a coin flip, isn't it? And so the, the military first responders, uh, they give away challenge coins. I bet you have all received some or you've given them away yourselves. Uh, and so I developed a uh, challenge coin for the old school. So it's not obviously Im as important as, as those uh, heroes that we have, but on one side it says challenge, so I think it's the only one that says the actual word challenge on it. And on the other side it says opportunity. Okay? And the idea is that with every challenge that comes along, there is an equal or greater opportunity. Right? And so if you have that mindset, kind of like the attitude and altitude thing I talked about earlier, when the coin of life flips and it comes up opportunity, what do you do with it? It's not a trick question. You take it. Okay. However, most of the time what happens? It comes up challenge. And when that happens, what do you have? Say it again. You have an opportunity. So you are playing the game of life, if I can use that metaphor, with a two-sided coin if you have this attitude. It's just another way of saying persevere, right? Always persevere. And so that's what the, the coin is a reminder of. So for those of you that have served our country, John, Rick, did I see another hand over here? Yes. 
Okay. I, I brought one for everybody. Jose as well. Yeah, so let me just give those uh, to you. Thank you for your service. Yeah, appreciate it. And um, thank you. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. And then uh, who else? Right up here. You got a Baylor shirt, so you're going to like the Baylor shirt up there. Thanks for your, your service. And actually, here's a, here's a little package that tells that story I just gave you. You bet. And then one more. I came prepared. Here we go. Jose, I think you have probably the most time, 15 years. Is that right? Yeah. How many? 25. 25 years. What, what branches? Uh, Air Force, including the tour in Vietnam, and okay. then uh, that was four years, and then 21 in the Army. All right. Excellent. Eight years in the Army. Army. Six in Army National Guard. Army National Guard, and? 15. In? Six, uh, six years active, and nine years in reserve. All right. Thank you. Let's give them a hand.